Hi there, and welcome to Ancestral Recall. I'm your host, Eli Kaplan. This is a magic show dealing with the history of Magic the Gathering over 20 years, set by set. Today is our conclusion to 2004's Champions of Kamigawa, the first set of Kamigawa Block, a setting based on medieval Japan, where the spirits of the land have arisen out of primal rage against all living things. We've done a show on the setting of and mechanics, and last time we looked at the first four colors of the color wheel as well as many of the cycles. Today, we're going to finish off the set with a look at the green cards, artifacts, and lands. We'll scope out the most expensive cards and give the set a final verdict. Sit back and enjoy the stories. We're starting off with a real gem. Azusa, Lost But Seeking, is definitely one of the most beautiful pieces of art in the set, and her ability to let you play two more lands per turn can lead to a Quite a lot of tricks. She is a staple in Commander and recently found a home in the Summer Bloom Amulet Combo deck in Mother. Talking about extra land drops, Budoka Gardener also provides players with a cheaper alternative. There's no mana cost involved, and if you can manage to get 10 lands into play, the Gardener flips into Dokai, Weaver of Life, who churns out absolutely massive token creatures. I like this card quite a bit, as it's a cool spin on ramp. City of Solitude, first printed in Visions, was a powerful tool for keeping the pace of play fast. Players couldn't play either spells or abilities except on their own turn, and this was a huge hoser against Blue. Champs has a similar card, Dosan the Falling Leaf, though Dosan doesn't stop abilities. I like this because hosing activated abilities is a bridge a bit too far for me. I like doing stuff, and since this effect is on a creature, not an enchantment, it's much easier to deal with. Glimpse of Nature is a powerful combo enabler, letting you turn creature spells into cantrips for a single turn. This is often used as a key combo component in Legacy and Vintage Elves decks, since it got the Banhammer in Modern. Oops. I love the art on Hanakami, which is rather disturbing despite its sunny disposition. Regrowing an arcane spell and being excellent soul shift father made this card an incredibly effective card advantage engine in Limited. Heartbeat of Spring is a green reprint of ABU's Mana Flare. Mark Rosewater said that he had submitted this same card in endless files, but it took Brian Tinsman at the helm to finally get this card to see print. This was an incredibly powerful card in Kamigawa block constructed. Kashi Tribe Reaver is a typical snake warrior wielding weapons that tap a creature it damages and keeps it tapped on their controller's next upkeep step. Having regeneration also kept this guy in the fight. This was a frequent first pick for green drafters. Kamigawa kept pushing the efficiency of green creatures. A combination of Shroud and 6-4 stats on Kodama of the North Tree attracted quite a few ramp players. Kodama of the South Tree's cheaper cost and mini overrun effect made it the best green bomb in Limited, however. Kodama's Reach is one of the most powerful ramp spells ever printed in Limited, since its arcane nature allowed canny players to splice on additional effects. While searching for lands late game generally isn't that exciting, Reach breaks that pattern. Another amazing ramp card that got widely adopted by casual and tournament players alike was Sakura Tribe Elder, the Snake Shaman Wardens of the Holy Cherry Trees. Rampant growth on top of a Womom body added tons of versatility to Green's arsenal. A reprint and conspiracy has satisfied the needs of many newer casual players. At the time, I played Wear Away a lot more often than most other players, which was one of my key edges in the format. The splice cost is quite high, sure, but as a gate for other splice effects, this is plenty good. And in Sealed, you will end up running into enchantment or artifact bombs, such as the Homden or Umezawa's Jikte. When you can get some versatility on top of a naturalize effect, such as a 4-4 body, or the ability to destroy a flyer, that's when you need to run this in limited. And here, well, people didn't pick up on the utility of splice. So now I'm going to tell you about an equipment that, stay on target, builds up a lock over time. Stay on target. The card in this case is Hankyu, an unwavering bow. 
but Hankyu takes time to wind and even needs passing from one wielder to another to maximize its utility. I imagine Porkins from A New Hope coaching players on how to use this card effectively. If you have an EDH deck themed on Legends, possibly headed by, say, Commander Sise, then your obscure mana rock of choice should be Honor Worn Shaku. This folded fan lets you tap any legendary permanent for a colorless mana and ignores summoning sickness. It also adds one mana itself. It's narrow, but there are very few cards out there that focus so hard on legends. A shaku is a paper fan, such as the kind that you see people whack each other with in Manzai videos. Journeyer's Kite. While the initial investment of five mana to break even on cards is steep, the ability to search for a basic land and add it to your hand at will is going to appeal to some. Blue and black decks will most likely be the ones most interested in this ability. Then again, maybe it's just better to have efficient card draw spells like Brainstorm and Ponder instead. But this is an option. The most notorious pair of blades wielded by Samurai is Oathkeeper, Takeno's Daisho. A Daisho is a matched set of Katana and Wakizashi. If you can arm a Samurai with these blades, then that Samurai will never fall in battle until disarmed. The pump ability is also nice. If you're getting tired of players using counter magic and instant speed card draw on EDH and want to shut them down, you don't have to rely on Vision City of Solitude. City of Solitude is probably the best choice out there, locking down instants of any stripe, but not all of us have access to green mana. Uba Mask is a fascinating artifact, forcing players to show off all their draws and making players use their spells on the turn they draw them. Now, the mask doesn't get rid of their current hand, it just affects future draws. But if you're looking to shut down card draw shenanigans, this artifact's a great choice. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please forgive me, for I'm going to sing to you a song of my people with this next card. You may not know the song I'm referring to, but this is a reference I must make. Last of our artifacts is that bane of judges in multiplayer games, Sensei's Divining Top. Oh, dirtle, 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 I made it out of clay. Oh, dirtle, 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 and with it also play. I do not like, I have not liked, and I will not like Divining Top. Yes, it lets you craft excellent draws, but at the cost of opponents looking at you with a sullen stare, wondering when you're going to actually do something that affects the table instead of literally spinning your wheels. In multiplayer, this is near unforgivable. It's also uber obnoxious with Cold Snap's counterbalance, as legacy players know, but that isn't the point. Oh, dirtle, 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 so much mana I'll pay. Oh, dirtle, 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 just ban hammer, okay. Divining top boy they. Whew, is everyone gone now? Well, now I guess I'll talk about the lands. Boseiju who shelters all, is another amazing way of fighting counter magic. It has the drawback of coming into play tapped and costs two life every time you tap it. But instants and sorceries that use mana from this land are uncounterable. This was a major tool against control decks. The deck that used this land the most in standard was Tooth and Nail, fighting the mono blue decks that immediately cropped up as soon as Affinity's artifact lands were banned. And Boseju was well worth the price. Let's talk about Boseju's Descendant. The functionality has been flipped to help creatures dodge counter magic with Avacim Resort's Cavern of Souls. This land has been picking up a bunch of traction in Modern as of this moment, and I really enjoy playing with it. Forbidden Orchard is a land that gives players access to any color for the modest price of giving an opponent a 1-1 spirit token every time you tap it. Generally speaking, most decks would consider this a near-fatal flaw, but one vintage staple archetype flocked to this land, Oath of Druids. Oath of Druids is one of the most broken enchantments in all of Magic, letting a player dump a creature from their library for free if an opponent controls more creatures than him or her. And there was no better way to sneak guys onto the other side of the table than Forbidden Orchard. This was a major shakeup for Extended when it first saw print, though at the time, the power level of the creatures that Oath ran was lower. For you Vorthoses out there, Hall of the Bandit Lord is occupied by Godo. And if you're playing EDH and want to one-shot people with generals, then this is the land you want to have. The life cost is serious business, 
But then again, hasty generals also happen to be serious business. This failed to have an impact on Standard, however. Before we get to the final verdict, let's take a short break and look at the top 10 most valuable cards from Champions of Kamigawa. Final verdict. I need to start off by saying that these reviews are not objective, they're my opinion. This has been the case from day one, and I want to express the views that I observed about champions from others before I get into my thoughts, and I got to see a wide variety of perspectives on the set. Let's talk about the setting. I was living in Japan when the set came out and through its entire run of standard, and while my Japanese wasn't good enough, I didn't think that most Japanese players were enamored with the flavor. This was medieval Japan filtered through a foreign sensibility with some names that didn't sound as cool as actual Japanese popular media dealing with similar settings. In the Reikai, the land of dark spirits, got passed over for a very generic river of dreams. Did anyone ever shout Henshin in a hokey fashion when one of their cards flipped? I never heard that in my local game store. And there's a lot of indigenous religious imagery in the set. The whole expansion symbol, the tori, is a religious one. It's a marker in front of Shinto shrines to denote the difference between the holy and the regular. So Japanese players, I think they felt hesitant when foreign game developers played with these tropes. Yes, there were Japanese artists such as Itoku and Americans intimately familiar with Japanese culture such as Ron Foster closely working with the creative and design team throughout the process. This set is not something totally created by outsiders, but champions did not have the commonly used tropes that Japanese anime and manga treat a similar setting. The energy, the attitude of a jump magazine that allowed for a certain suspension of disbelief and not caring about the cultural inaccuracies. And that's why I think it fell short of the mark. Japan needs a certain amount of trust to let people go wild with its cultural tropes. The Japanese review of 2003's Last Samurai movie were rather tepid, looking at Hollywood's interpretation as shallow. 2004's Lost in Translation also came under fire for making Japan look shallow, robot-like, and just not getting it in the service of the plot. So that was the larger cultural picture when Champions of Kamigawa got released. Just to be clear, Japan definitely enjoys Western films. When I was there, the Matrix series was a big hit. The later Star Wars movies brought huge crowds into the theaters, but when Americans turn the camera onto Japan, Japanese audiences get very critical. Guillermo del Toro's Pacific Rim didn't go over well. It looks like Big Hero 6 managed to avoid this criticism, but then again, Japan and Disney have had a very positive relationship over time. The American reception for Champions of Kamigawa was problematic. A lot of gamers were expecting the anime version of Japan, whatever that is. 
Now, I used to watch a lot of anime back in the 90s on VHS, such as Rama One Half, Neon Genesis Evangelion, and Irresponsible Captain Tyler, to name a few. Anime is just an animated medium with a few common conventions. It's not a genre. And I was a mythology fan of my youth. Kamigawa is mythology, with a horrific twist. And the American audience wasn't quite primed for mythology. Where were the big key blasts? The Kamehamehas? Where were the ninjas? Well, that's a huge problem with the set. That's the most obvious thing about Japanese fantasy that Americans can identify. They're so much cooler than samurai, but champions didn't even address the ninja. They were hiding away in betrayers. I'll give the ninja much more scrutiny next time, since, you know, next time we're looking at betrayers, which is the set with the ninja. But for three or four months, the audience's anticipated expectations were not being met, and that hurt the set. I know that I have an unusual perspective, and this set was almost tailor-made for me in terms of flavor, but am I an anomaly? That's hard to say. In terms of gameplay, Champions of Kamigawa was a fantastic limited format, rewarding players for evaluating mana curves and finding the most efficient way to combine their bombs and journeymen spirits and samurai. It was extremely skill testing, and the late game rewards for playing Splice Arcane spells were huge and gratifying. Thanks to Soul Shift, players rarely lacked something to do with their mana. And there were no downside mechanics either. All five colors had their strong points, though in my experience blue and green lagged behind the other colors in draft. There were lots of viable strategies, and the tribal linears outside spirits weren't dominating like in Innistrad. Just to be clear, I'm talking a little bit ahead here, but diluting the set with Betrayers of Kamigawa did not hurt the format. The tricks got more diverse. Adding Saviors of Kamigawa to the mix is where the format got unwieldy. But Triple Champs Draft was superb, and I'm not just saying that because that's the limited set that got me two blue envelopes. I'm saying that because the format was deep and complex. So many of the problems with Champions of Kamigawa came from issues outside the set itself. When champs rotated in and Onslaught Block rotated out, there was a singular beast dominating standard, Affinity. Arcbound Ravager, Disciple of the Vault, Frogmite, and six artifact lands were taking down players consistently on turns three and four, and people were main decking artifact removal. Shatter was too slow to deal with the deck. And Champions of Kamigawa did not feature any cards that were properly suited to deal with the robot supremacy. Neither did Betrayers. We had to wait until Saviors rolled around before we finally got a card that addressed the 800-pound gorilla in the room. Mirrodin was broken, and Champs couldn't stand up against it until Bannings pushed the disruptive deck out of the environment. This is exactly the same as in 1999, when Mercadian Masks fell on its face while interacting with the decadence that was Urza Saga. The gems of masks and Kamigawa were there all along, but couldn't be understood as they came out because of the previous set distorting the player's perceptions. And once Ravnica came out, the power of the guild's gold cards outshined many of the Kamigawa cards as well. Ravnica was a home run that created tons of new standard archetypes, and was it was a blast to draft with as well, so Kamigawa was still the bridesmaid, never the bride. And yes, as Mark Rosewater has criticized the set for before, Splice, Spiritcraft, and Arcane were parasitic. They didn't interact well with the sets before it or after it, sadly. Yes, Goblin players got new toys, but Elf and Merfolk players were left out in the cold. The Orochi and Soratami were not easily relatable for the European and North American market. I don't know how the Chinese reaction was, but given the country's rocky political and historical relationship with Japan, I can only assume that didn't go over well there either. The flip cards were cool, but newer players definitely have problems using them. The narrow shrunken art on the flip cards didn't help either. Fortunately, all the legends of the sets and cards that interacted with legends ended up being great additions to EDH slash Commander, one of the greatest casual formats of Magic, so the set and block has seen a fair amount of rehabilitation in recent years. The spirits 
truly are bizarre. They're some of magic's freakiest, most inspiring, most dreadful creatures, and yet they don't have the murder, death, kill menace that many other factions do. And that's a breath of fresh air. So I feel like the spirits did hit their mark as being a cool new antagonist. Many players just didn't get them. While public reactions to art are very much a product of their time, and I don't want to deny people their opinions, I'm of the position that while Kamigawa didn't meet most of the audience's expectations with the setting, the product that was presented was deep, rich, and gave players entertaining gameplay. It was a vibrant, beautiful world with compelling conflict. It's not Kamigawa's fault that Ravnica had so many cool archetypes, or that Mirrodin's brokenness pushed it out of limelight. And Wizards has been unfair in calling Kamigawa a failure just because it didn't sell as well as they had hoped. Champions Dynamics led to many great innovations in the future. We got an easy-to-play, easily-parsed version of flanking with Bushido. Without flip cards, we might not have had Innistrad's sweet double face cards. Without the conflict between spirits and flesh, we might not have had the conflict between Mirrens and Phyrexians in Scar's Block. It bridged the gap between sets reflecting real-world cultures from Arabians to Mirage to Theros, and taught many lessons on how to reflect Earth in fantasy. And Splice was an awesome variant of Kicker. So I'm going to give Champions of Kamigawa a grade of 7 out of 10, very good, if not excellent. Champs impacted many formats. It's definitely a fantastic limited format to play, so track down some of the commons, uncommons, and rares, and build a cube, and you'll have some of the most fun you can have with magic. Thanks for watching. Next time we'll find out exactly where those ninja were hidden away with Betrayers of Kamigawa. So if you enjoyed this video, please hammer on that like button and go back and check out my older videos. Share this with your friends, and please check in by subscribing. Don't forget to leave a comment too. And in particular, I'd like to hear what your favorite card from Champs is. This is Eli Kaplan for Ancestral Recall, signing off. Good games and good luck.